Hello, good morning everyone. We'll begin the program now. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, Pune International Centre program on moving India to a new growth trajectory. A lecture by Dr. Rakesh Mohan. To begin with, may I please invite on stage chairperson of the program, Mr. Ishaat Hussain, sir. Thank you. May I also invite on stage Dr. Rakesh Mohan, please. It gives me great pleasure to introduce both Mr. Ishaat Hussain and Dr. Rakesh Mohan to all of you. Mr. Ishaat Hussain was a non-executive director on the board of Tata Sons. Mr. Hussain joined the board as executive director in July 1999 and then took over as finance director in July 2000. He is also a director of several Tata companies, including Tata Industries, Tata Steel and Oltas. Besides, he served as chairman of Oltas and Tata Sky. He also served as member of the SEBI Committee on Insider Trading and Primary Capital Markets. He was also a member at CII prior to joining Tata Sons. Mr. Hussain was senior VP and executive director of finance at Tata Steel for almost 10 years. He joined the board of Indian Tube Company, a Tata Steel associate company in 1981 and moved to Tata Steel in 83 after Indian Tube was merged with Tata Steel. Mr. Hussain graduated in economics from St. Stephen's College, New Delhi. He is a chartered accountant of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales, FCA. We are thankful, uh, Mr. Hussain, for taking time out and agreeing to chair the session today. Thank you so much. Yes, once in a while I remind in PIC programs that we never have any penalties for clapping or the decibel levels of clapping. So do not hesitate. I know we are in Pune and we are frugal about many things, but hopefully not about clappings. That sounds like it. Great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Rakesh Mohan. We are very, very honored to have him here today. Dr. Rakesh Mohan teaches at Yale University as senior fellow, Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. He is also distinguished fellow at Brookings India and non-resident senior research fellow of Stanford Center for International Development at Stanford University. He is a senior advisor to the McKinsey Global Institute. He is also a member of the board of Nestle India, Kirloskar Brothers here in Pune, and Mahindra United World College of India. Dr. Rakesh Mohan held the position of ED at the IMF Washington DC, representing India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Bhutan from 2012 to 2015. He was also Chairman, National Transport Development Policy Committee, GOI, in the rank of Minister of State. In addition, he was Vice Chairman, Indian Institute of Human Settlements, now proposed to be amongst the first Indian innovation universities. Prior to his position at the IMF, Dr. Mohan was Professor in the Practice of International Economics and Finance, School of Management, and Senior Fellow at Jackson Institute of Global Affairs, Yale University. At university, he taught in every fall semester. Prior to that, he was Distinguished Consulting Professor at the Stanford Center for International Development in Stanford University. Many of you would be aware uh, his stints in India before that. He had earlier held the position of Deputy Governor of RBI from September 2002 to October 2004 and July 2005 to June 2009. During the period, October 2004 to 2005, he was Secretary, DEA, Department of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance, Government of India. He was Chief Economic Advisor, Ministry of Finance, Government of India in 2001-2 and has held several other senior positions in the Government of India. This, by the way, is a brief summary of their profile. I'll just take a moment before we start, uh, before we begin the lecture by Dr. Rakesh Mohan. The flow of the program, I'll just explain you. We would have, uh, the chairperson, if he likes, could do the welcome remarks, or if he likes, he can do welcome remarks and concluding remarks, we'll leave it to the chairperson. Then we'll have the uh, uh, 
lecture by uh, Dr. Rakesh Mohan. We'll have a brief Q&A and we'll have concluding remarks from the chairperson and I'll come back again to propose a vote of thanks. But before we begin the program, on behalf of this great institute, we must first welcome again both of you. So I'll request the director of the institute, Dr. Pertsure, to please uh, come and welcome both Dr. Rakesh Mohan as well as Mr. Ishad Hussain. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I request the chairperson to give his opening remarks. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. It would be rather squeamish on my part to duck making a statement. So I will make a very brief statement now, and I will certainly also join in the concluding remarks. You know, I have uh, read this book, which uh, Rakesh, I'll call him Rakesh because he's an old friend of mine, uh, has written. And I noticed there are lots of young people in the audience uh, who I presume are students of economics. I think it'll, it's a must read for you. And I would request you to pay very careful attention to what he says. Because what he says in his book is truly very, very relevant. It's got the finest data that I have ever seen being put together in one place. So if you are doing your economics paper, I think you just have to refer to that data. So that will be useful. But more importantly, you must have noticed from our biodatas that he is very much a man from, of public service, whereas I am very much a corporate person. And I think some of the points which he has raised in the book and the challenges which we face now going forward, we clearly have captured the low-hanging fruit. We've done a lot of good work. But I think now is the time to have a very managerial approach to solving India's problems. And that's why I said I will come in and just tell you that this is the point which Rakesh is, I'm not wanting to steal your thunder, Rakesh, but the point which he's making in the book now is that we have to build capacity. We've got to build managerial capacity. You go to a government office, for example, or you, and you compare that with going to a, even a store now, a reasonably good store. Just look at the difference in the ambience. Look at the difference in the attitude of people. So it's really a managerial issue now that we are facing. Building capacity. Building capacity at the Patwari level. Building capacity at the district, at, at the uh, block level. I mean, that is where I think the next challenge for us is. It's not in, the, in North Block and South Block. The action is now on, in the field. And I would implore a lot of you young people to seriously think of making careers for, for yourself where you are, because if we want to take this nation forward, we have to contribute towards it. And you are the people, you are the managers who will take us forward. So I'll stop there. And I'll come back in my concluding remarks, but over to you, uh, Rakesh. Thank you very much, uh, Ishat uh, and uh, Mr. Girbane. Uh, thank you so much. Um, let me, uh, to begin with, uh, thank uh, the Pune International Center and uh, Dr. Vijay Kelkar, except that I don't thank him for not being here. Uh, uh, he just informed me a few days back with a shocker that after having invited me here, that I wouldn't be here. So uh, I'm not very really pleased with him, which I've told him as well. But I also, by the way, understand why he is not here. And it is to do with the institution that I was first involved with and then he succeeded me. So in that sense, he's doing the right thing, actually. Um, um, also, I'm really uh, pleased uh, and honored to have this opportunity of giving a talk at this historic Gokhale Institute and thank uh, Dr. Parchure for providing uh, these facilities, the students, uh, it's uh, um, always in some sense much more interesting to talk to students and now that I am a professor that uh, I'm much more used to talking to students than people of my vintage. So thank you very much for uh, providing these facilities and uh, giving up to the students and to me. Uh, it is of course a real privilege to be here, an institute that uh, is associated with many of the founders of uh, modern India, from uh, Mr. Gokhale himself, Gandhiji, 
Malvia, Jinnah, including Jinnah, uh, Mr. Gad, Dr. Gadgil. So it's really an honor to, uh, to be here. Um, so uh, as uh, the, you can see from the title that uh, the whole talk is about moving to uh, India to a new growth trajectory. Um, given what is happening currently today in the economy, when I first gave this talk uh, at Brookings in Delhi, uh, the moderator was TN Nainan, the business standard. So he quipped saying, Rakesh, you have been very smart. You haven't said this new growth trajectory is going to be downwards or upwards. Um, and given the circumstances today, uh, one almost feels that, look, how can we be talking about a new growth trajectory upwards? But I always remain an optimist and I do think it's, it's feasible for us, to, in fact, that we, that we have to move to a higher growth uh, trajectory. Um, let me start off right away. Um, will you give me a warning about, uh, Mr. Girvani, would you give me a warning about 10 minutes before I should finish? Take your time. Okay. No, if you take my time, I'll, I'll go on. So you have to just okay. okay. Um, so uh, just to set the stage, uh, the Indian GDP per capita is now around two thousand dollars, US uh, two thousand um, dollars. To put us in perspective, uh, China is already around nine thousand dollars, and we were about the same in 1990, India and China. That's the difference uh, that has cropped up between, and since all of you, so many of you are students here, that uh, difference in compounding 10% a year versus seven, six to seven percent a year, over 30 years, is really piles up. So they're 9,000 and we are 2,000. Um, Thailand, Thailand, it's also 6,000. So we are about a third of Thailand actually. Um, Indian GDP is about. 2.6 trillion or 2.7 trillion or thereabouts, and China is about a little over 12, 12 and a half trillion. So, um, uh, so, so we have no time to lose. We have no reason to be complacent. We have no reason to be self-satisfied. Uh, even though we have actually done quite well uh, by any historical standard in the last 35 to 40 years, but um, we have to aim to double uh, per capita GDP every 10 years, I, per capita GDP going up by about 7% a year. And even if we do that, which at present uh, is not happening, even if we double per capita GDP every year, which means GDP increasing by more than 8% a year, 20 years from now, we will be at around $8,000 per capita, just doubling every decade from 2000 to reach 8000 so what that means is that even if we succeed in achieving a growth rate higher for 20 years than we ever have, 20 years from now, our per capita GDP at current dollars will be less than what China is today. That's what I really wanted to get through. But therefore, therefore, we have absolutely no time to lose. Um, and it's not just we want to be the same as China. Much more important, of course, is that we really want, we really need to aim to eliminate poverty. And I often say that eliminate poverty in my lifetime. Since I'm now 71, 20 years from now, if I'm around, I'll be 90. And that's about maximum I can expect uh, to be around. So that's why the 20-year perspective, uh, that is my life, the rest of, the possible rest of my lifetime. Um, so, uh, that's in some sense what we need to aim for. Um, so, the, the key point is that the policy focus on high growth must be restored. Um, in fact, ever since independence, uh, our predominant policy focus had always been high growth, of course, with distribution, um, along with social welfare and poverty elimination. But I have to say that in the last decade or so, last six, seven years, decade or something like that, we have lost that focus on high growth. 
and there's been too much attention being given to efficiency in distribution. Not that distribution is, don't uh, get me wrong, that I do believe that distribution is very, very important, but you can't distribute unless you grow. Um, and and uh, looking at the, the history of the successful, the most successful growth countries, one thing that you find in common is high sustained growth cannot be achieved unless an overarching policy focus on growth. And so that's what this whole uh, presentation is, is all about. So what I'm going to do, first we'll very quickly review India's past growth record since independence very quickly. Then shed a little bit of light on the current economic situation, but not too much. Um, provide then the possible uh, contours of a, of a possible contour of a possible growth scenario. And I want to hasten to add that what I'm projecting in terms of the growth scenario is not a forecast, but really saying that if we want to grow at 8% plus, these are the implications of such a growth contour. And then give an outline of the policy measures to, uh, needed to achieve such growth. And uh, finally, uh, provide a special focus on institutional development that is needed, particularly the strengthening of government, which is what uh, Ishat was just uh, talking about. So that's what I will end with. So, um, the since independence, uh, we really have had an overall reasonably, reasonably consistent growth pattern uh, from independence. Um, an important point is finance predominantly by domestic savings. There was, however, first, um, 1950 to 65, it was a major, major departure from a hundred years of economic stagnation. A hundred years. Um, that is a hundred years of almost zero per capita growth. And 1950 to 65, we achieved something like three and a half to four percent. Uh, and this is very creditable given that the savings rate was just around 11 percent in the early 1950s. So one of the things that I emphasize and uh, remind everyone that has become very popular to say that we had a quote Hindu rate of growth uh, that is not said with pride but as, a, as an epithet for the low growth in the 1950s and 1960s that Mr. Nehru stuck us with a socialist pattern etc. The fact of the matter is that it was the biggest departure in going from zero to three and a half to four uh, immediately after independence. And that was really an act of imagination uh, uh, and vision. Um, so, uh, and, and also in terms of the policies followed that in the 1950s, they were the, what you might call, international best practice at the time. Import substitution, planning, that was what was being advocated by everyone around the world. So he was not out of line. What happened is, after that, 1965 to 80, that whereas other countries were changing, particularly in Asia, we did not change. So we've had a long, long-term upward trend interspersed uh, with phases of stagnation. Um, so from 1965 to 80, uh, we had stag relative stagnation, um, and then uh, certain balanced payments crises. Of course, we had terrible drought, etc. Um, and then we started regaining our growth record after 1980, and especially after 1990. Uh, by the way, uh, I will not. Uh, you sort of, I sort of double my time in the sense so you, ha you have to hear me and look at the slides at the same time because I will not refer to the slides and I hope that they will roughly coincide uh, with what I'm saying. Um, so there was actually very robust industrial growth in the 1950s, uh, around 7 to 8 percent a year. And we've never exceeded that, incidentally, uh, for a period of 10 years at the 1950s. Um, so, uh, and, and there has been, along with the industrial growth, uh, there has been consistent acceleration, the growth of services through all, most of the period. Um, the agricultural growth has been modest through the whole period, of course, uh, accompanied by uh, weather-induced relatively high volatility. I want to emphasize again that Indian growth has been fueled by consistent increases in domestic savings and investment, and you can see that from the charts. 
there's been a relatively continuous increase in savings and that the slowdown in growth has almost always been accompanied by or caused by a slowdown in growth of savings. And that is what has happened in the last eight, nine years or so. So um, very interestingly, domestic savings, particularly household savings, particularly household financial savings, were growing continuously with some, uh, with some stagnation in some periods until around early 1990s. And household financial savings uh, came to around 10% of GDP in the early 1990s and stayed at around 10% of GDP until 2010 or thereabouts. And for reasons I don't really fully understand, they have fallen from around 10% of GDP to around 7% of GDP uh, since, the early, since around 2011, 12 or so. And that has now been accompanied by somewhat slower growth. So a key issue is the revival of uh, savings and investment uh, to get a higher growth uh, in the future. Um, one uh, other point that uh, I uh, always emphasize is uh, specifically in the current scenario um, that no country has achieved sustained high growth over a period of 20, 30 years without high industrial growth. Um, service growth that accompanies industrial growth, you can't have only industrial growth, you have to have service growth at the same time. And um, the, 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 uh, in, in the golden, what I call the golden period of 2003 to 8, high industrial growth is very high, service growth is also high, and as it happened, agricultural growth was also high between 2003 to 2008. And all this was, was enabled by a combination of positive domestic and international demand, also booming international economy right through the 2000s till what I always call the North Atlantic financial crisis. Um, let me just also say that those, who are, those of you who are schooled in this, that I'm using the old national account series until 2012 and the new series since 2012, uh, after 2012. Uh, so, what was the high growth in this period enabled by? One, after the 1991 reforms, there was a huge amount of restructuring by industry. And Ishad, maybe in your concluding remarks, you can give them a glimpse of all the huge restructuring all of you did after 1991. And I know that in the Tatras in particular, you did a lot of restructuring within factories, company as a whole, holding company as, as well, had a different view of how to run industry Tata Steel, Tata Motors, everything actually. Uh, there was huge restructuring measures by industry after the uh, 91 reforms and particularly actually there was a slowdown in the late 1990s and the slowdown in fact um, induced industry to do a lot of restructuring towards uh, uh, much greater efficiency. Low real interest rates during the whole period. Also uh, a very successful fiscal consolidation from high fiscal deficits to low fiscal deficits by 2008 uh, or thereabouts. Um, and of course, I already mentioned increased savings rate, also very robust infrastructure investment. Uh, and as I mentioned, also strong global demand. So uh, we had uh, very high export growth uh, right through the 2000s till around 2012. Um, and um, just to put pat on my back, uh, very competent monetary management during that period, uh, leading to low inflation. Um, the current deceleration, uh, there was a significant deceleration 2012 to 2014, uh, partly caused by what I always say was an excess monetary and fiscal stimulus in 2008-9. It was actually North Atlantic, that is US and Europe would have financial crisis, we did not have a financial crisis. But we pretended that we had a financial crisis. Um, and we did a huge fiscal stimulus. We cut the excise rates in half in late 2008, early 2009. And that increased the fiscal deficit. And we brought down the interest rate to 3.25 within six months or so. And as a consequence of that, uh, we had high inflation. We had, we had succeeded uh, from the mid-50s to mid-90s we'd had average inflation of around 7% a year. 
we successfully brought them down to around five, five and a half percent from mid 90s to late 2000s. And because of the excess fiscal and monetary stimulation, inflation went up to over 10 percent again. And uh, the, the withdrawal of fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus was too slow. And so uh, we were stuck with the very high inflation. Also, we increased MSP of, uh, for, for food uh, much more than the inflation actually. Um, and so we had all around inflation during that period. And uh, because the fiscal deficit increased, therefore the government was borrowing much more from the, from the public and therefore the private sector started getting crowding out because the government was taking up all the savings. Uh, furthermore, in that period, that is around 2009-10 to around 12-13, to around 12, 13, um, the Reserve Bank had somehow stopped intervening in the foreign exchange market, had stopped accumulating reserves, and they let, and because uh, our st growth was still higher than the rest of the world, there were huge forex inflows. As a consequence, the exchange, the real exchange rate appreciated significantly with an adverse impact on export growth from which we have not yet recovered. Um, so the exports had reached 17% of GDP, manufactured goods exports, uh, had reached 17% of GDP um, uh, by 2012, and they've now come down to 12%. There's actually been zero, zero, zero manufactured goods export growth since 2012. 2012, 2018, there was a bit of recovery, 18, 19, but 2012 to 2018, there was zero growth in manufactured exports. Once again, no country has grown fast with a high growth in exports. Um, another thing that happened in that period was perhaps uh, excessive uh, reliance on PPP uh, in infrastructure, public-private partnership infrastructure, huge amount of lending from the banks to the private sector uh, for infrastructure, a lot of which then became NPAs as among the reasons the high NPAs that we have. And because of the high inflation, there was initially a diversion of uh, household financial savings to uh, gold. Uh, etc. And so 2013, we almost had a crisis because of uh, uh, incre increase in current account deficit, loss of confidence uh, from the rest of the world, uh, then accompanied by Mr. Bernanke's taper tantrum, and we had a, almost a crisis in 2013, which uh, something we are very good at is that we get into a crisis, we usually solve it, which we did in late 2013. So uh, that's just a very quick overview of growth since independence, um, high growth period 2003-2008, and then stagnation. And now I'm moving on to developing a possible future growth scenario 20 from now till say 2035. Um, let me just again uh, emphasize that this is not a forecast. This is providing the possibility of that if you want to achieve 8.5% growth, what do we need to do? Uh, and what is a macro consistent framework? Um, <coughs> Mr. Girbane had mentioned um, um, my, uh, the report that I chaired on national transport policy. As part of the report on, uh, on transport policy, we had uh, developed a macro consistent projection model for 20 years. So the numbers here are derived from that, but not but they've been tweaked a little bit to uh, update from where we were in 2014. So, um, uh, the, the, among the key points is that uh, uh, both savings rates and investment rates have to go up substantially. It is not possible to achieve 8 to 9% growth without such an increase in savings and investment. So, what are the key features uh, of this growth scenario? I'm giving you just a snapshot, obviously not at any details of the model, etc. First, and this is extremely important, and at present nowhere in sight. If you want to achieve 8% overall growth, manufacturing has to grow at 10% per year. We have never achieved this. But we cannot grow 8% a year, say over the next 20 years, unless we have 10% manufacturing growth. Second, agriculture needs to go 4% around. Our average since independence is around 3%. So we need to also step up agriculture. Government focuses on this 
as the key objective. Um, to reiterate uh, key issues raising savings and investment and within that to raise household financial savings back from 7% to 10% plus of GDP. As I said, I don't quite understand why it has gone down so much. That's something for people to do research on, look at the numbers more carefully and see what has happened because I frankly don't quite uh, understand it. I understood it in 2012 to 14 when uh, household financial savings had got diverted to gold as a hedge against inflation. But that's no longer the case because inflation is down, uh, so I don't quite understand it. Uh, private corporate sector savings also need to increase further. What are private corporate sector savings? They are retained profits essentially, which means that profit growth has to be higher but it's come down. And from the profit growth, higher retained earnings, higher retained earnings to do higher investment. Um, and um, also uh, government savings, i.e. fiscal deficit, particularly revenue deficit, um, had, had go, have gone down and that also needs to be restored. I fiscal deficit has to be at prudent levels and revenue deficit really has to come down to zero. Um, one other important point is I've talked about um, uh, domestic savings being the bedrock of the uh, resources that India has used for investment. However, we probably need something like two to two and a half percent of external savings, I net capital flows into the country per year. Um, and now, uh, given that uh, uh, GDP is around 2.7 trillion, so even 2 to 2.5% of GDP uh, amounts to uh, something like 60, 70 billion dollars of net capital flows. So that's not a small amount in absolute numbers. Um, in addition, uh, when you have, if, if you have a consistent 2 to 2.5% of GDP current account deficit, i.e. 2 to 2.5% net capital flows, both equity and debt, it means you're piling up foreign liabilities at that rate, adding 70, 80 billion, 60, 70, 80 billion a year of external liabilities, both debt and equity. This also means for external stability, you have to keep adding to your forex reserves. Um, and therefore, uh, one calculation is that we need to add about 2% of GDP, around 50, 60, 70 billion a year, to forex reserves a year. So what does that mean? That if you take the external savings, 2 to 2.5% for current account deficit, around 2% of GDP for adding forex reserves, you need about 100 to 120 billion dollars of external flows. Okay? That's not a small amount in absolute terms. And of course, as GDP increases, it starts increasing even further. And so once again, what is, that, what is the implication of that? You need a healthy domestic private sector. There's no reason why foreigners are going to invest if they don't see domestic firms investing. Second, they need to have confidence that we'll keep growing. And so all of this goes together and this was indeed happening between, uh, during the 2000s. An important issue on this, I've done a fair amount of work in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, manufacturing growth, high manufacturing growth, requires corresponding provision for power, transportation, and logistics. Trade expansion, of what I'm talking about, requires consistent investment in ports, airports, domestic transport linkages, and trade logistics. Public sector, now, one of the things I think we want somewhat astray. I'm somewhat guilty of that because I chaired a report on a committee on infrastructure investment for the private uh, in the late, in the mid 1990s, where I was among the people who really propagated inviting much more private investment into infrastructure, which I continue to believe in. But we may have gone uh, too far, and it's a simple economics rule that public goods and services have, have to be provided by the government private goods and services by the private sector and in between where, where there's mixture of public and private goods by public-private partnerships. We have tried to take PPP to extreme levels of even trying to do public goods and services and that's where we've come a cropper in terms of the NPAs, etc. So uh, public investment, we need to be clear, public investment infrastructure is has to be higher in the railways, 
I have to say that in the budget, recent budget, uh, the finance minister said, gave a large number for investment in the railways, but she said, we don't have money, so we'll have to get private sector to invest. It won't come. So you have to be realistic about that. It won't do increase investment in, in, in the railways. It has to be in the public sector, roads and bridges, urban infrastructure. Private sector investment in infrastructure, clearly in communication, telecommunication, ports, airports, commercial vehicles, etc., which are all remunerative uh, sectors. Electricity is the middle, um, mainly because of our tariff policies. And also, transmission is a public good, effectively. And so it's very difficult to get private investment in transmission. Um, in particular, in the railways, I had the privilege of chairing a committee in the railways also in 1999-2000 and then the transport in 2014. And one of the conclusions I came to is that one very good thing we've done is in the 1990s, investment in roads and railways was roughly equal, around 0.4-0.5% of GDP. With Prime Minister Vajpayee's initiation of the Prime Minister Gram Sadak Yojana and the National Highway Development Program, that rate, the invest, total investment in roads has gone up to around 1% of GDP, which is about, about right. Railways has remained around 0.5%. This government has indeed been increasing uh, railways investment, but that needs to go up to around 1% of GDP. And so that's the sort of requirements for uh, infrastructure. Um, the so let me now uh, uh, come to, um, I didn't want to dwell too much on the projections because that is just to give some idea of what the implications are for 8% growth. Let me come now to policy imperatives for a big push. Um, the, the Indian uh, tax GDP ratio is too low. You cannot have higher public investment unless the tax GDP ratio goes up. And that's what this chart is illustrating to you, that we are below the line. Um, the gross tax revenue uh, in 2007-8 had gone up to around 12% of GDP. 2018-19 was 11%, i.e. 1% of GDP lower than what it was 10 years ago. Um, and this is a puzzle in the sense that, uh, in fact, it's worse in that somehow our tax GDP ratio has remained rock solid at around 10% of GDP, plus minus 1 or 2% for 30 years. This doesn't make any sense. I mean, we all know, just all of you, and Pune has got transformed in the last 30 years. Just look around in Pune. It's huge increases in incomes, absolutely huge. Huge increases in, uh, uh, in fancy apartments, middle level apartments, uh, low, I mean, low income flats, etc., etc., around the whole country. How can it be that the tax GDP ratio is the same? It should just, just by, if you didn't, it should have gone up if you did nothing, at, actually. But we've had major and very good tax reforms over 30 years, latest being GST. So I often quip that no way in the world do any people, any citizens like to pay taxes. It seems that we must be one of the few countries but the government doesn't seem to want to collect taxes. Uh, despite all the accusations of tax terrorism, etc., it's just unbelievable the tax GDP ratio has not increased. To, to give an example, 2016-17, um, there were only 1.3 million people, i.e. 13 lakh people, who reported more than 20 lakhs income per year in the whole country. Only 13 lakhs is more than 20 lakhs. Um, in the same year, about 3 million cars were sold. That gives an idea of the underpayment of taxes and the government's unwillingness to collect. Um, it was alleged that demonetization would have a positive income uh, in impact on income tax collection. It hasn't happened. So the income tax collection was lower, was lower in 2018-19, according to the government figures, than 2017-18 as a proportion of GDP. Of course, higher in absolute terms. Another example. The current budget has set the minimum tax threshold at 5 lakhs a year. You don't get tax where it's 5 lakhs a year. And of course, in addition, you get 1.5 lakhs exemption if you invest in PP, in, in provident fund, etc. That comes as the US dollar exchange rate is about $9,300. So you don't pay any tax if you earn less than $9,000 a year. 
the US per capita income is 25 times ours, little over $50,000. You know what is that tax threshold? $13,000. So, in fact, it is, see, that tax threshold is such that if your students who are here, if you go to the US to study and you get a full scholarship, tuition plus living, your uh, tuition scholarship is not taxed. But suppose you get $20,000 for living, you'll have to pay tax on that. Because uh, that's, that's the culture of tax compliance and culture of tax collection. And each time we raise this tax threshold, that's what I mean, government unwilling to collect taxes. Um, so my point is that to do the kind of things we need to do in terms of investment in public infrastructure, investment in health, investment in education, it cannot be done by PPP. It has to be done by the government and therefore the tax GDP ratio has to increase and it needs to increase by at least 3%. Having achieved 12% 2007 8 that's not a big ask from 11% to 14 If we have achieved 12 uh, 10 years ago, why can't we do 14 now and the next 5-10 years? And of course we need to trim subsidies on the ex expenditure side. Um, uh, I've said that I don't quite understand why the household savings have fallen. Um, they uh, need to, uh, they've gone about 7% of GDP, um, they, they, they need to go up at least 10% of GDP. One possible, uh, uh, one possible policy measure that you can do is that um, one demographic change that is taking place, uh, when I say, look, I, I, if nothing serious happens to me, I expect to live till to about 90, could have said that 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So that uh, there's a real demographic shift towards higher life expectancy uh, on the one hand, which should mean that everyone by themselves must be incentivized to do higher savings for their old age. More so because uh, with urbanization, uh, joint families are breaking up. Um, and so as we get old, we have to look after ourselves. By the way, this was brought home to me uh, about 20 years ago, when my son was about 10 years old, I asked him as a joke, and this is real actually, I asked him as a joke when he was 10 years old, I said, will you look after me when I'm old? So his, his answer was a question, how old will I be when you're old? So I said, well, I'll be around early 30s, uh, he is 30 now. So he said, no, in my 30s I'll be off on my own adventure, so you better look after yourself. Um, and so that may not make me thinking of policy to incentivize savings. And the point is that given longer life expectancy, um, if you are 30 when a child is born, at 25 when a child is born, uh, by the time you're 65, he or she is only 30, 35 years old. If you're then going to live another 30, 25, 30 years, and suppose you have to live with him or her, that means from the age of 35, 30, 35, till he or she is 60, when he himself retires, he, she retires, he's stuck with you. That's not going to happen. So you better start saving all of the young people from today for your old age. Um, and the government in some sense needs to provide incentives to do contractual savings more seriously. Uh, and there should be, I don't really fully understand why there isn't a higher demand from households themselves for pensions, life insurance, and things like that. Uh, for their old age and I don't in the numbers I don't see an increase in the proportion of savings going into pensions life insurance uh, etc and of course there's another side to it that if there's more savings going into long-term savings those are the savings that are then available for infrastructure investments those are the long-term <coughs> sources of uh, finance uh, so it's it tackles social welfare at the same time higher financial savings more things available for investment and particularly for infrastructure. Uh, another issue I suppose that may be a problem why savings have come down is the whole financial sector problem that has been afflicting us for the last three, four, five years. Now it's gone to the NBFCs. So we really need the government, really need to provide, to, 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 to act much more quickly to restore confidence in the whole banking system and the non-banking system so that people have much greater confidence uh, in the financial system and go back to savings. And therefore it needs uh, overall financial sector reform, which I won't go to into actual uh, uh, 
uh, content of that. Uh, I've already mentioned the foreign savings. Um, two points. One, we need foreign savings, but of the order of two to and a half percent of GDP, not much higher. So we cannot rely on foreign savings for growth. At the same time, we do need foreign savings of, uh, of, of a limited amount. Um, a fully open capital account is dangerous since it leads to large flows in search of arbitrage leading to booms and busts. We've experienced that in 2013. We must not repeat that. Um, the uh, current budget has proposed various measures to increase both private equity and debt flows. I feel that it's somewhat ill-advised that it could lead to external instability. So I'm saying both things. We need foreign savings in a prudent fashion. Not go, don't go all out. We know how to manage these things and we should continue that. Um, also, that excessive inflow leads to upward pressure on the exchange rate. Um, my understanding is that our exchange rate is probably 15% overvalued. It could be 10%, it could be 12%, it could be 17%, something of that order. And that's one of the reasons why exports have been so stagnant. Also, uh, the, the announcement of the sovereign external bond, I feel very nervous about. There are many, other, many issues, but one issue that really bothers me is that if the government itself borrows in foreign currency, it will have a huge, invest, it'll have huge incentive to not let the exchange to depreciate as it, as it should in nominal terms. Um, and so I think that's a huge argument, that because, it, because if it's borrowing in foreign currency, if it doesn't want its uh, uh, liabilities to go up, it will want to keep the exchange rate constant, and that would be very, very bad for the economy. Um, so managing capital flows is critical to preserve financial stability. What does need to be encouraged, of course, is foreign direct investment and long-term debt for industrial investment. Um, before I say, uh, talk a little bit more about industry, I have to first say that it is a little difficult to interpret current trends in the manufacturing private sector. National account statistics suggest that manufacturing growth from 2011 to 18 was around 7 to 7.5% of GDP in terms of value added. However, both the annual survey of industries and the index of industrial production suggest around 4% in that period. Um, what is more disturbing is that capital goods production growth, capital produ the, the production of capital goods domestically, the growth has been zero, zero, zero for seven to eight years. Similarly, growth in the import of capital goods also zero for seven to eight years. Um, and also, as already mentioned, zero growth in manufactured goods exports. Um, also, if you look at the corporate data on sales and profit growth, it's also come down, as we all aware. Um, so somehow, these data don't match. National account saying 7, 7.5% 7 growth, zero growth in exports, zero growth in capital goods production, zero growth in capital goods imports. Therefore, must, presumably, the investment growth must be very low. So this doesn't make sense. Uh, I won't go further on that because Arvind Subramaniam has said much more on this. But there is a, there's the, looking at the data, the problem in interpreting. Having said that, what is clear is that industrial investment is subdued. Industrial growth is subdued, particularly in the current year. Um, and therefore, there really, we cannot get the kind of growth I'm talking about unless there's a really large-scale revival of private sector animal spirits and renewed investments. Um, I don't have very good solutions to that and then unless there's an overall focus by the government in cooperation with consultations with all kinds of stakeholders in the economy to understand what's the problem. Certainly some things one I do understand. Successful fiscal consolidation and inflation management will allow for lowering of uh, nominal and real interest rates. Um, also higher corporate profitability and savings if real interest rates are brought down. Um, also is imperative to maintain a competitive real exchange rate on a sustained basis. I've already said that I believe that it's uh, at least 10, 10, 12 percent overvalued. And one evidence, one piece of evidence for this overvaluation is the renewed huge demands for protection coming from industry. They were not there for many, many years actually, after 91. And uh, demands for protection from industry quite naturally if they're feeling the heat, and then government responding 
and we've reversed policy over about 25 years, we're starting to increase import tariffs again. Um, so the recent budgets have increased number of import duties, reversing, as I said, uh, long-term practice since the 91 reforms. So those are some things that I do understand that need to be done. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the share of uh, output and the share of manufacturing output uh, and employment is uh, far too low uh, uh, in, the, in India. Um, and the, the labor, also the share of uh, labor, labor intensive manufacturing, both the domestic production as well for exports, also too low. Um, so, one app, you know, to, get an, to get an idea of the real problem there, there are only 14 million people employed in organized sector manufacturing. Only 14 million. China is more than 100 million in organized sector, equivalent organized sector manufacturing. So that's the gap in terms of employment in the industrial sector. Now that Chinese wages are going up, Chinese GDP per capita is going up, a um, lot of Chinese manufacturing is moving out and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future to the Vietnam, to Philippines, to Cambodia, to Bangladesh, but not to India. And this has to be corrected. This is an opportunity that won't come again. Um, we also have to make Indian cities fit for manufacturing jobs, urban land market reforms, most of all, bold labor market reforms to promote labor flexibility. Um, I don't think that's the only problem, but nonetheless, that is, an, that is essential. And I don't quite understand why we can't do labor market reforms, because it's only 14 million people employed in manufacturing, in organized sector manufacturing. If we do bold labor market reforms, you can double that employment. So it seems to me that with proper communication of saying that, look, we're not, we not destroying jobs, that by doing this, uh, we will double or even more uh, manufacturing sector jobs. We could also have announcement, we could, we could have grandfathering in the sense that no one is currently employed will get affected. You can do that. So that people, labor also has to be protected. They must have confidence that government is not anti-labor, but actually is doing with pro-labor reforms. And to do that, you can also have schemes which actually we had devised in 1994-95 of uh, what we call the National Renewal Fund to provide a fund for protection of labor should they get affected by this change. And furthermore, uh, we need to improve health and education levels in the labor force, including worker training and retraining. One of the other things one finds if you look at the successful countries who have done uh, industri high industrial growth and high export growth is uh, really format uh, uh, institutions for organized government industry partnership. Um, government shouldn't get affected by slogans like Sut Boot Ki Sarkar. You have to, if you want high growth, you have to have cooperation between industry and the government. We had that in the 1990s and 2000s on a pretty successful basis. Um, government and industry have to move together, but of course without crony capitalism. Uh, finally, uh, one other issue is, uh, and maybe Ishad again, I'm putting you on the spot various issues, that there's a real lack of technology investment in R&D in Indian industry, both private sector and public sector. And why is that? We had thought when we did the 91 reforms that with greater competition, both domestic, because we were de-licensing, greater competition international through trade reform and FDI, that the pressure of higher competition will induce Indian private sector to invest more in technology and R&D. That has not happened. Um, among the key scholars on this is Noshad Forbes in Pune, who was going to be here, but unfortunately is not here. Um, but he has done great research on this, and he has a chapter in my book on India Transformed, which documents what I'm saying. And so, once again, I think government and industry have to get together to understand why is it. Because one of the characteristics of the successful countries, Korea, China, Japan much earlier, has been Taiwan, much greater R&D investment. These are the countries that have escaped the so-called middle income trap. It's not true of Latin America, and they've not escaped that, uh, the middle income trap. So that is essential. Let me come to agriculture. Um, we need what you might call a second green revolution. You can call it anything else if you like. Um, there's one simple key point, which is that our self-image of agriculture 
which continues till today, um, is based on the production of cereals, wheat, rice, and coarse cereals. Now, if I ask, if I if I took a poll in this audience, what proportion of your, of course, most of students wouldn't even know, but if you could uh, guess, what proportion of your food expenditure is on cereals, that is, wheat, rice, bread, etc. Probably only more than 10, 15 percent. You spend much more on fruits, vegetables, milk, meat, fish, chicken, etc., etc. Um, so uh, it's no longer the case that agriculture should only agriculture policy should concentrate on cereals. Of course, it's sort of been neglected. But the fact of the matter is that that uh, policy that that policy that our, our image of agriculture has to change from not just cereals, but also include particularly dairying, horticulture, fish, poultry, meat, wineries, etc. Um, and that does need uh, aggressive development of the supply chain, linking the entire process from farm to market. There's a huge potential, huge potential for employment income generation uh, and innovation um, to encourage large format, uh, if you encourage large format retail partners, retail, uh, large format retail in food, supermarkets and so on, that will then have a demand pull for all, for all these food products. One of the, my biggest education was when I went to China about 10 years ago, I was there for only two and a half days, and there was a Peking University student who was looking after me. He said, where do you want, to? we had a half a day to look around apart from the conference I went to. So I said, he said, where do you want to go? He thought I would say, I want to see the Olympic Stadium. It was just after the 2008 Olympics. So I said, no, so I said, no, no I'm not interested in that. Take me to a supermarket. And so he was amazed. But I went to the Chinese supermarket, and I was fascinated because uh, in this Chinese supermarket, first, all kinds of foreign foods. But 80% of the supermarket was a huge amount of Chinese foods. Since it was all in Chinese, I couldn't understand what, what they were, but 80% plus was Chinese packaged foods of diff diff all different kinds. So if you do this, you have a huge demand pull actually, and the whole agriculture sector gets better organized. Um, so that's one. Uh, and and you, you, need the, the, you need a sort of, a, to do this, you need a nationwide coordinated program on a mission basis. We've done that before in the first Green Revolution. Um, when we had a coordinated program of R&D, extension, fertilizer, su uh, fertilizer supply, uh, credit, electricity supply, etc. Now this is a bit different because wheat and rice are homogeneous products, it's easier to organize that. The products that I've talked about are much more heterogeneous, much more regional concentrated, many, many more different varieties, it's much more complicated and much more of a mix between private sector and public sector. This is why you need PPPs. Um, I'm not an expert in agriculture, even though my first published paper is indeed in agriculture. But nonetheless, this is, I think, a huge, which I don't see any focus on. Second, within that, um, agricultural research and universities. One of the things that was done in the late 60s, early 70s, was a huge expansion of agricultural universities and research programs and extension. Now, you never hear of these universities, Pantnagar, Ludhiana, and many, almost every state has an agriculture university. You never hear of them now. And you can't do this without much greater R&D. And every state has it, actually. So you can be regionally disaggregated. Um, and finally, a consistent trade policy for agricultural exports. India is indeed competitive agricultural exports, but we have a stop-go policy. So, uh, as I said, I'm not uh, expert agriculture, and so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, for, but it's a, it's a huge opportunity, actually from farm to market, from the primary product to, to different stages of processing, investment in the whole cold chain, um, cold storages, cold transport, uh, and, and so on. And now that the Prime Minister Ram Sadak Yojana has been in action for almost 20 years, almost every village is actually connected. So it's feasible to do that now. You couldn't do it 20 years ago, actually. Okay. Um, I'll have to restrain myself in talking about infrastructure. Since I've done three reports uh, accounting for about 2,000 pages on infrastructure, so I'll have to 
restrain myself. But let me just emphasize a few things. One, that uh, I had mentioned earlier that for high manufacturing growth, for high export growth, you really need an uh, efficient transport system to reduce transport costs and also to increase speed of uh, spread of goods uh, uh, across both domestically as well as for export. Now, um, transport systems are characteristically very interlinked. Highways, railways, ports, airports, and logistics. Now, this cannot be done without a huge amount of coordination, which is currently absent. Um, in the India Transport Report of 2014, we had suggested that we need a much better, this again comes back to capacity, uh, Ishaq, that, uh, planning, that we need a planning capacity in infrastructure for medium and long term because you need to coordinate at the central level across these sectors, vertically with the states and within states. So you need some, something like offices for transport strategy, both at the central level and at the state level. And focus, and finally, uh, and, and furthermore, a specific focus on the modernization and expansion of railways. Those of you who are more interested in this, uh, you can go to my website, which is rakeshmohan.com, that has a one tab for reports. In that tab, you'll find the uh, uh, link to the, plan to the erstwhile planning commission. That still works. And that'll get you to the transport report. And that gives you uh, a thousand pages of detail if you're interested. Um, I already mentioned on PPP, the ha over-reliance in PPP has faced many problems. One, of course, is facing us is emergence of large NPAs in banking. And both corporate sector and bank balance sheets have been affected. Um, one other side, of, side impact, impact of that also is that um, the Indian corporate sector, uh, I was talking to Ishaat before the um, lecture, uh, the Indian private sector is very used to rent-seeking. So whenever the license is to be got, they run for those licenses. So one of the, in my perception, one of the negative consequences of PPP is once again opening of licensing regime. So all the large corporate groups rushed for those licenses. And they got distracted from their core manufacturing and other activities because there was easier money to be made. Of course, many of them become a cropper because of losses, etc. But apart from the intrinsic issues with PPPs, I think that one negative byproduct has been uh, distracting uh, uh, all the large corporate sector to PPP and go going away from the anything basic, basic manufacturing and so on. I already said that we need to revisit the use of PPP, public investment to be expanded in the provision of public goods and services, and Private equity investment is attractive only with some sectors that provide clear competitive peculiar returns, like telecom, airports, ports, etc., and only the sectors that have a mix of public and private goods are suitable for PPP. Uh, hence, a greater role of public investment, better planning, programming, and implementation capacity. Um, as I said, I can go on on that, but I just uh, step short on that. Let me come to a very important part and which is where I now depart from many of my economist friends, that uh, to, to give an understanding of what I'm going to say, that the organizing principle of 1991 reforms was to take the government out of interference in the private sector. And I fully believe in that. As it happens, I drafted the 1991 industrial policy reform. So I just wanted to make clear that, it's, that I'm 100% for the government being out of economic activity, except for infrastructure investment. And the idea was to empower the private sector to free from government interference, to do what it can do best. And actually, it responded quite amazingly, quite amazingly, how the private sector responded through the 90s and 2000s. And a lot, of course, has been done in this area. More can be done in terms of making uh, uh, business easier. And overall, of course, the Indian private sector has grown beyond anyone's imagination since the early 1990s. And of course, corresponding, the Indian economy has attained a higher growth path. Now, I do believe that the private sector is increasingly constrained by the lack of efficient functioning of the government at all, in all spheres and at all levels, from the central government level to the panchayat level, as you mentioned, Dishat. 
Um, what failures, despite 7% growth, what failures have we had last 25, 30 years? One, structural transformation has been limited in terms of manufacturing growth not going up as much as we had thought. Second, very important, even more important, neglected social needs. Nutrition, health services, primary and secondary schooling, and agrarian distress. And because of the lack of manufacturing growth, inadequate movement of people from rural to urban areas. Uh, it, people don't quite understand this in the sense that for agriculture or the rural welfare to go up, there has to be much more movement out from agriculture. Given that agriculture now accounts for less than 15% of GDP, if you have something like 50% people uh, engaged in agriculture, it's telling you straight away that 50% um, people dependent on 15% of output, the other 50 on 85%. So that tells you it's straight away. Or the problems in agriculture, you have to get people out. That's the story of all development in the world, in history. Uh, the public service system is unable to deliver adequate public services. So there's a loss of confidence in the government and public sector to deliver essential public services. I think this has been illustrated in various elections. Um, the, what, dis, what, what, what worries me is that the government itself has lost confidence in its ability to provide public services. And so you find the government wants to entrust the private sector even in areas such as primary health and education which should really be the government's responsibility. Let me remind you that even the United States, most capitalist country in the world, education is free for everyone till the high school level, till the secondary school level. Of course, many people, they also have private schools and so on. People, some people choose to go to private schools, but it is ensured for everyone up to the secondary school level. Uh, and even universities, 90% of students going to university, go to state universities, which are highly funded by the government. Only 10% or less are in private universities. Um, so the second generation of economic reforms must be to empower the government, the public sector largely defined, to deliver public goods and services efficiently. Um, we need to develop state capacity. One of the ways I look at it is that in the old days, when someone worked for the government, and you asked him, what did you do, or her? Although there were not that many hers uh, in government service. And people want to say very proudly, I work for the government. Today you ask someone, if you work for the government, where do you work? I work for the government. You know? Uh, you ask someone, where do you work? Uh, if it's in IT, I work in IT. Uh, I'm in a startup. You know? So let me ask you all, how many of you would want to work in some form of public service, raise your hands, all the students. That's very encouraging. That's the best response I've ever got, by the way, in any audience. So, so nice to you. And the point is that in terms of job satisfaction, right? Job satisfaction, what do you do substantively? I'm not knocking the private sector at all, because you can't grow if the private sector doesn't grow. But in terms of job satisfaction, look, the complexity of running an urban water system running electricity systems, organizing wastewater treatment, all kinds of very mundane things. It's very complicated, right? Much more, much more exciting. And the government itself doesn't encourage you to do this. Um, so we need to restore the prestige of public service. We need to restore the prestige of public service. This needs empowerment of government at all levels, central, state, and local. We need to understand that public management systems are large and complex. Management of urbanization, management of railways, management of ports. I don't mean the port terminal or the port as a whole. Uh, airports, again, not the airport terminal, but the airport as a whole. Hospital systems. They're all very complex systems. But business schools don't teach. Business schools focus on private uh, business. Again, I'm not saying they shouldn't, because private business should also, should also be well managed. But the point is that public management is very interesting. And systems, therefore, need to be evolved to organize training of existing employees and induction, induction of domain expertise at the middle and high levels. Hence, there's a need for overall 
overhaul of the administrative system. The local government system is indeed the weakest link in the Indian administrative system. Most countries have local governments that deliver public services and are empowered. Um, you don't have uh, viceroys like IAS uh, viceroys in districts. And the important point there is that, that yes, we, we, there, was, there has been a role, there was a role of building the country as a whole to have an organized administrative services all India. But with the transfer system, someone posted in a district, he knows or she knows, they're going to be there for only two or three years. They really have no intrinsic interest in that place, except how it might improve their career if they do well. You need people more locally involved, nowhere else in the world. In the UK, you don't have a national service. Everything is managed uh, locally by, by, by counties. Um, so you need to really strengthen local government with high expertise and only then, of course, will people like you be incentivized to go there. Um, and so you need to really develop uh, major components there. You really need a national program for improvement public administration with emphasis on technical competence. Uh, I'm using now a, a term that has probably not been heard of for many years, scientific temper. Mr. Nehru invented the term scientific temper. Um, so, uh, I've, I've already referred to this R&D in both public and private sectors, but it's more than that. Uh, I feel that there's been a regrettable erosion in the attention given to science and technology and development of technical competence in the country recent years. Somehow, unfortunately, technology, the word technology, has got associated with IT. Information technology, unfortunately, is called information technology. So technology has got equated with IT. Of course you need IT, but there's much more to technology. Sustained growth requires consistent improvement of quality at all levels, quality of education, promotion of science and technology, recognition for the need of technical competence in all spheres of activity in both public and private sector. Um, we need to restore the prestige of teaching at all levels, particularly science and engineering, uh, technocrats in both public and private sectors. Um, we need to engage the industry to induce them for higher technological investment. I don't know how and why, but obviously we engage the industry. Um, regenerate, expand, and introduce excellence R&D institutions. Um, and we need to enhance technical capacity in all public sector service organizations, delivering infrastructure in uh, with infrastructure and, and other investment services. And once again, only those countries that have done this have been able to escape the middle income traps such as Japan, China, Korea, and Taiwan, and some few others. Um, one particular view that uh, it's interesting that I think there is almost universal approbation uh, when this government abolished the Planning Commission in 2014-15. Um, in looking at uh, countries that have achieved sustained high growth uh, at our income level, one, they've all had from the top an overarching strate strategic focus on growth. Second, all of them, Korea, Japan in the early, in the 50s and 60s, China and others, they've all been overseen by strong, technically competent organization that sets the country's overall strategic framework and provides coordination for the needed investment of growth, particularly infrastructure investment. The Planning Commission used to do this in India. There were similar organizations in other countries I mentioned, and China continues to have one. Interestingly, because the word planning has gone out of fashion, um, the, uh, China also used to have a, a Planning Commission equivalent. They also figured out that planning was a bad word, so now they call it the National Development and Reform Commission. It's not very different from renaming to the BPIO. So that's, I have no problem with the renaming. But um, it's, it's, just, it's a very strong major coordinator of Chinese uh, growth. Uh, therefore, I do believe there's been error to abolish the Planning Commission, particularly taking away the, the, the fund allocation powers from the Planning Commission or the Niti IO. Um, also, interestingly, when uh, the Planning Commission was, was, was uh, established in the 50s, 
it was consciously established as a technocratic institution because the ministries did not have technocratic capacity. Um, it is correct that the Planning Commission over the years um, had deteriorated and it had become excessively bureaucratized. And its technocratic functions had become less and less. So there's no question it needed a full overhaul. Um, so, uh, but, but there was no need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I do believe that Niti Aayog, I think Dr. Kelkar himself has lectured on this and, and propagated the same idea. Uh, the Niti Aayog must be strengthly strengthened and reorganized so it can frame long-term integrated programs for investment and management in key sectors, coordinate between ministries and states, but it can do this only if it has fund allocation powers again, and second, that it has technocratic competence which is actually respected. People don't like people bossing them around if they don't know very much. People are quite happy to be bossed around if they respect the person who's coordinating and directing. So that is absolutely essential. Okay, so I come to the end. Uh, yeah, five minutes will be fine. So uh, I sort of say a new social, what, what do we need? A new social contract, growth, growth, employment, and universal basic services. I emphasize universal basic services, not the mistaken idea of many of my friends, economist friends, of universal basic income. Many surveys that have been done suggest that people are not looking for universal basic income. If you can ensure them universal basic services, clean water, access to energy, access to transport, access to health and education, you don't need universal basic income. And at this level of our income, with 10% of GDP as, uh, as, as tax, tax, uh, central tax revenues, there are the 6% for the state, about 16% total, that you cannot have, you have universal basic income. 1% uh, of GDP is 160,000 crores. Just imagine that instead of spending 1% of GDP on subsidies, or universal basic income, you spend an extra 160,000 crores a year on health, primary health, primary and secondary education, uh, Im continue to improve Ram uh, connectivity and so on, continue transformed as we have been in the last so many years. So the government must communicate, one, that its overarching focus is on economic growth in order to remove poverty and to bring the whole population to, to a reasonable living standard. Two, that the progress made in the last 25 years has demonstrated that growth does transform the country. Three, growth strategy must have employment generation as its focus, particularly in manufacturing and manufactured exports. Four, the provision of essential public services requires the government of higher revenues. Um, and hence, there's a need for enforcing much better tax compliance to increase the tax GDP ratio, not higher tax rates. Um, and hence, universal basic services and not universal basic incomes. Um, my two points of departure from the, everyone is talking about these things. One, a real focus on industrial, on, on, on uh, increasing industrial growth to double digits. It will not happen by itself. Within that, a real focus on labor using manufacturing, long overdue bold economic reforms, bold labor reforms. If we can do demonetization, if we can revoke Article 370, what's the problem in doing bold labor reforms? I don't understand that. Um, maintaining a realistic and competitive exchange rate, encourage large export-oriented competitive manufacturing firms, um, and of course emphasis on better functioning uh, of, uh, of, of uh, government to promote uh, economic growth. Uh, one point I want to make on this, um, um, on, on, on manufactured export growth. It is often said in India, 
forget it. Uh, we've missed the bus. Uh, we can't we can't repeat what the Asian countries did in the last 30 years: China, um, Korea, Taiwan, China, etc. Nothing can be further from the truth. Um, as was mentioned in my introduction, I'm also associated with the McKinsey Global Institute. They have done a study called Outperformers. And they've, as part of the study, they've done projections, which I think are reasonable projections, for the next 15, 20 years, 15 years, of incremental global GDP growth. Most of that comes from Asia. Just think of it in simple terms. China, plus all of ASEAN, plus India, rest of South Asia. That's just under 4 billion people, about 3.5 billion people. Now, if we grow at 5% a year, not 8, 5% a year, the next 15 years, the accretion to GDP global will be higher than the last 15 years. Second, with this kind of growth in people's incomes of 3.5 to 4 billion people, you know, when income grows, what do you do? You get a larger house, you get a better house, you populate the house with all kinds of stuff, you go out to eat much more, etc., etc. So, the, so the incremental demand for goods in the world is going to be higher in, in absolute terms, not in terms of growth rate, but in absolute terms in the last 15 years. Therefore, there's absolutely no shortage of demand for goods in the world. Yes, there is a, a trade slump going on globally right now because of particular issues to do with China, US uh, uh, trade wars and so on. But if you look at the next 15 years, there's absolutely no shortage of demand for manufactured goods and we better get into that act. My second point of departure uh, is indeed to emphasize the better functioning of government to promote growth. Um, one of the things that is not appreciated is that actually government of Indian government at all levels is very small. If you take the number of government servants, civil servants at every level by some proportion of the population, we are among the very low levels, much lower than the US by the way. Um, if you look at say the strength of the Ministry of Finance, the strength of the Commerce Ministry, the strength of the Transport Ministry, etc., it's minuscule. You know how many people there are at the US Department of Transport, this is the most capitalist country in the world, 60,000. Now, even if 30,000, even half of them are doing nothing, even then they're 30,000 and all high levels of commerce. They're not just sitting around doing nothing, they are coordinating transfer, even though most things are private in that country. So, part of the social contract, commitment to deliver universal basic services. Um, encourage, second, encourage competitive markets. The private sector has to compete and not get rents. And finally, to recognize the need for a growth promoting institution, uh, Niti Aayog, strengthening Niti Aayog, to art articulate national economic strategy towards growth and coordinate public investment infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. What we'll do is, uh, looking at time, we'll take only a couple of questions, then we'll get the concluding remarks from the chairperson and we'll conclude the program. Uh, I'm just going to raise literally two questions, both of them at a time, and then the speaker will... Uh, Tejas, you there? Yeah. So we'll start in the third row, please, and then we'll go one behind. Yeah. Request, please make your question quick one, so that uh, the speaker is able to respond to it. Sir. I am Wing Commander Ravindra Parusnes. Uh, sir, you have shown us the way for improved growth trajectory. Certainly, the resource improvements and uh, in all instrumentations of productions. However, you have also shown the restrictions coming into the way, mainly the government infrastructure. The government infrastructure has, in spite of advice from many experts and demands from all of us users, as well as criticism from the media, has not improved. What other pressure point would you advise so that government is forced to act improvement of roads, energy, energy particularly the loss in supply system itself is so huge that uh, it restricts the improvement in our profitability. So uh, what other point would you advise? And my second question is coming to the Sir, specifics. We'll, to, we'll have a question to one more speaker. Just, just a small thing. To sp uh, specifics, 
uh, in agricultural sector we have i'll take two products tomato and um, and uh, onions both the fluctuation in price has been tremendous so much so that farmers are forced to throw their product on the road but in onions the uh, uh, perishability is not that bad the shelf life is good and yet the price is fluctuating from 20 to 200 in my childhood it never That's exceeded question, between 5 to 10 so not question, more than that question, so so why why this fluctuation is there an artificial uh, a force also responsible beyond the market uh, forces of demand and production. Thank you, sir. We'll take one last question from there and then we'll get the speaker to comment. I am a principal scientist in agriculture. My question is that there is a tremendous scope to increase the agriculture uh, production in the country because we have very good resources in our country. Therefore, first important is that human resource development to the farmer's level should be done then the technology can be adopted. Otherwise, it is a very difficult because ultimately farmer is the main person to adopt the technology. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sorry, I could have, I would have liked to take many, many more questions. This is what I enjoy most, but you're very keen to. All right, uh, this one is the bonus coming from the speaker himself. So that goes to students. I know all of us are young at heart and very good students, but those who are studying, uh, one at the fag end of it, and there'll be one question to a, uh, a girl student, so if, uh, that depends on which one raises hand first. Uh, so recently I read your essay on uh, financial markets and stability and uh, I was actually eager to ask you, second decade of the 21st century, how, uh, in your opinion, how has uh, the financial stability been and uh, how, to what extent have the policymakers been successful? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. As I said, uh, there will be one to the girl student, this is at the on my right hand side please. Sir, basically you mentioned about the universal basic services. So I wanted to ask that it is, is it only the government that can provide it or it can also be the corporate social responsibility that can have a very huge role in this? Um, first, on the government, um, I don't think that any external pressure will make the government change. So, um, it really has to come from the top. That there has to be a commitment from the top that we really need to change government functioning. Now there are some signs of it in, this, in some small, very, very small signs of inducting lateral uh, people into the government. That's very small. There has to be a much, it, it can only come if there's realization at the top. And again, I'll repeat that if you have a, uh, if, if you, if you have a, uh, uh, highest focus on achieving growth, and you start analyzing, look, what is stopping us from growing, then you will understand that there's a government functioning problem. And then, of course, once the realization is there, then, of course, you can have lots of consultation in terms of what do we do? But then many people have different ideas. So that's the best I can, uh, I can suggest. On, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on agriculture, as I mentioned, but my simple understanding really is that, of course, onions, as you said, is not perishable, but nonetheless, if you have a much more functioning cold chain, and so you get uh, uh, all products at almost all seasons of the year uh, through large format retail markets, etc., much more organized marketing system, I would imagine that uh, the price fluctuation will be much less. Also, uh, not stop go and exports, because that also provide a certain degree of. Uh, of, of stability, it might also sometimes induce some instability. That also one has to be conscious of. So I think that's the only answer I give that perhaps is not the best answer. Um, I agree that uh, if we, uh, on, on the other question on, uh, on, on human development or human resource development agriculture, that remember that when the green revolution took place, that uh, there was a huge amount of extension activity. And that itself raised the awareness of the farmers to using modern inputs. And uh, there had to be a law, huge degree of extension to get the right mix of modern inputs between how much fertilizer, how much new seeds, uh, uh, how, how to do controlled irrigation, etc. All that was done, and that was 40, 50 years ago actually, 
40, 40 to 50 years ago. So if we could do it then, our education levels have improved tremendously in 50 years. There's no comparison of the education levels in rural areas. Not very good, but still much better than 50 years ago. If we could do that then, I presume that if you have focused uh, interventions towards higher levels of technology usage and farm practices, that farmers themselves will respond. And one of the indications of this, by the way, is, and I'll, this is connected to the last question that I'll come to, that one of the most encouraging indications is that people now at all levels of income, from the high to low, spend more, more than they can afford, actually, for their children's education. So that more and more poor people are sending their children to private schools because of the failure of the public school system, because they want their children to be educated. So that is telling you that people themselves want higher levels of education. So it seems to me that if there's even a greater in incentive, look, if we can educate, what will we do? We will become better farmers, better agriculturists. It will happen. Financial stability, that's a, more, that's a complicated question. Um, uh, all I can say is the following, that um, um, the, 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 uh, uh, first, that we, we really need that in the, in the early to mid-1990s, uh, when the whole financial system was essentially government-owned, um, that is to say all the banks, except the foreign banks, were public sector, 93% 90 of banking was public sector, insurance was public sector, etc. There was an overall look at what had to be done. And then there were all kinds of reforms ensued in all parts of the financial sector. We maintained a high degree of financial stability till around 2012, 13 or so. And then NPS have grown. Here also, we have done a great improvement to the introduction of the IBC, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, but that's not enough. So once again, I think there needs to be an overall view. Look, what's wrong going on? Why are there high NPAs? It's still not very well understood. And uh, so to then attack the issue of financial instability, but the other thing to appreciate actually is that despite the high NPAs, related to many other countries, we still have a high degree of financial stability. Finally, um, on education and basic services, um, Two points. One, that to my knowledge, no country that has done well has done without universal availability of health and education at the primary and secondary levels. Primary health and up to secondary school levels. In the United States also, education yes, but not health. And they're suffering because of that. Um, all of Europe has public health systems, for example. Um, so, um, whereas at the margin, yes, uh, NGOs, etc., can supply those services helped by the government. CSR, I don't agree. Uh, the CSR, yes, has its own place, but I don't believe it should be compulsory. Yes, they should be incentivized uh, to do CSR, but it's the job of the private sector to do its own job. If it's not doing its own job well, if its manufacturing growth is not taking place at the rate it should be, they should be concentrating on that is the government's responsibility to education. Yes, at the margin, they can help with their own communities. I have no problem with that. But you cannot think of the corporate sector. It is wrong to expect the corporate sector to do something it is not equipped to do. They have no incentive to do that. They must be, on the other hand, incentivized to grow much faster so that they pay higher taxes, not through higher tax rates, but because of higher growth, higher profits, and so on which can then supply the resources for providing universal basic services. Thank you so much, sir. May I now request Chairperson of the program, Mr. Ishad Hussain, to please give his concluding remarks, sir. As I mentioned to you at the beginning when I spoke that uh, you will be told all that you really need to know about economic theory and economic policy. And I think most of you will agree that I think I was reasonably correct. We've 
Uh, the time has passed uh, and all of you Time has passed and all of you, uh, including our chief guest, has other commitments. He has asked me to respond to two things. I don't think I really have the time because it's a very long answer that I would need to give you. But all that I can say is that the Indian private sector does rise to the occasion. And, for an ex and very briefly, I'll tell you, I was the finance director of Tata Steel. When, thanks to his paper, Mr. Manmohan Singh liberalized the Indian economy and on the 17th of January 1992, steel, which had a protection in certain items of 100%, was removed overnight and the prices of steel which were controlled were decontrolled. We used to be told what we could produce, how much we could produce, that was removed. So we were really completely now in an open environment. At that time, we were a highly inefficient steel company. We had 80,000 employees. And then we embarked on a course of modernization and growth and we have today produced Tata Steel, when I say we, I have now retired many years. Tata Steel today in Jamshedpur produces 12 million tons of steel with 25,000 people. So, sir, I cannot agree with you more that manufacturing has to grow if we are going to achieve A, increase in per capita incomes and see a reduction in there's no other way. The only other point I would like to make is that I was really heartened when uh, you asked who all would like to go into uh, government service. I think the majority put up their hands. In fact, some of the senior gentlemen in front as well, they, I was really heartened because underlying all that can, maybe specialists can talk about are certain basic principles of governance, ethics, morality. You cannot get away from those. And governance is large, one of the major elements of governance is how do you create the right incentives to people. And I think the incentive system today is highly skewed. When I see, I served, I served as chairman of Tata Capital, when I saw what salaries we paid in Tata Capital in the financial services sector and what we paid in Tata Steel, it was chalk and cheese. You know who got much more. I think the incentive systems are wrong. And if you look at it, if you look at the fat cats of the banking industry all over the world, if you take into account the losses the world suffered in the 2008 financial crisis, the banking sector has never made profits in its history from 1945. That is the truth. But yet, they are the most highly incentivized people. And I would have imagined that many of you would move to the financial services sector. But I'm very glad only a minority. So, sir, thank you very much. I have found it extremely illuminating. I have been a student of economics. And now I'll be a student of yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to, uh, to attend one of these programs for a simple reason that it's a decades of economic history. You get to listen in 70, 80 minutes. The past, the present, and the future. I would add an adjective, glorious future, but that depends on the bunch of things that are presented out here because that's not a promise unless those pathways are taken to reach out there. The decades of experience of somebody like Dr. Rakesh Mohan distilled in those 70-80 minutes is a wonderful treat. It's a wonderful treat for all of us, but especially for all of you young and bright minds, many of, who, many of you who raise their hands to say, you aspire to serve the people of India through the governmental and public services that you take up. It is for you that this could look like the great 
guidelines that you could have taken at this young and bright stage. It's wonderful, sir, to also hear somebody who has worked with generations of Indian industrialists, Indian industry leaders, right from Mr. G.R.D. Tata to Mr. Ratan Tata to, in the recent year, Mr. N. Chandrasekharan. Mr. Ishat Hussain has served through the Tata Trust, through the, sorry, my apologies, through the Tata group of companies, from manufacturing to the services, the whole conglomerate, conglomerate has delivered a whole lot good to the nation. It's wonderful to get both the experience from that private sector as well as, as, well as from the pub, public services, so to say, from the RBI to the government to for various committees and now as professor. We have recorded this video, sir, for the fact that many of those of us who couldn't be here today, including your dear friend, uh, could listen to it and could, could go through it. Dr. Kelkert did mention specifically to convey the fact that, that to convey his apologies to you that he couldn't be here and he is missing it. Mr. Anil Supnekar to come on stage and felicitate our guest with a tiny token of appreciation. Mr. Supnekar, if you could please come. Saili, if you could please help. It's a tiny, tiny token of appreciation and will request Mr. Supnekar to. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I declare that the program is concluded and look forward to see you at another PIC program in near future. Many, many thanks to each and every one of you.